Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Uh, I will present uh, this talk in English uh, because it's such a universal thing that I'm going to talk about as we all ha are having universal topics, as a matter of fact. What do you think about this uh, genius of uh, Kino, uh, the uh, creator of Mafalda? We are talking about creation, and uh, it inspired me to choose that title. All there is inside a pencil. Uh, most, and f most important of all, there is this creativity. Um, let's say the software, uh, human ingenuity and creativity. I came to talk rather about the hardware. That little uh, graphite thing uh, inside the pencil is the origin of uh, graphene. How could I explain to you what is graphite and what is graphene? Oh, I know, just a second. Thank you for waiting. Um, accidentally, I happened to have carried all the way here this beautiful book. Well, imagine we take graphite in a pencil and grind it as much as we can to the finest particle we could achieve. Then we look through the microscope and this is what we, let's say this is the tiniest particle of graphite we could get. Okay? Graphite is made inside of layers of carbon atoms, thousands of layers, such as the thousand pages of these books. Well, graphene would be each one of these individual layers. This kind of chicken wire of carbons is what graphene is. Imagine taking this graphite and dispersing the thousand graphene layers into the whole of this room. That is exactly what my, my challenge was. And uh, I got it. Next, please. First, there is dream. Dreaming is the first part. It was uh, the physicist Henri Poincaré who said, it is through imagination that we discover. The reason, reason we used to prove what we discover, but you need to dream about hypotheses. Let me share with you this, um, no, don't need to read all that, please. Uh, this is just um, an old web page I made uh, in 2002, cienciateca.com, and that was uh, an article on dreaming about carbon. And down there, I was writing, could we take graphite and isolate just a single layer of graphite? Well, I was one among many, if you want, dreamers. You can call it them also theoreticians who dreamt about those hypothetical uh, materials. The truth is that just one decade after that, we have been able to prepare that in the laboratory. There you have, on the right side, a suspension of very finely divided graphite in a solvent. You see there is a slurry. There are particles visible to the eye. On the left side, we have a solution of graphene, truly dispersed layers of uh, graphite, single by single layer as I pointed out before. So we have done it in the laboratory. We have, and many other people around the world have. Next one, please. Let's see what is inside. That solution on the left, this is. This is just one single flake of graphene. It looks like a flag, the flagship. We could use it as the flagship. And it's a funny image because it shows one was expecting there kind of, uh, I said, chicken wire of carbon atoms. And what you see is those dark, uh, large spots. 
Well, you know what we are looking at there? The same thing you see when uh, you have this waste basket that is indeed a chicken wire metal net and you see two of the nets overimposed. You see that kind of interference patterns. So it's an interesting one and just one example of the kind of flakes dissolved in that solution I showed. You might have noticed those things are, we said, 100 nanometers inside. Actually, their thickness is one atom thick and is about one nanometer, less than one nanometer thick. So, this uh, slide shows uh, a little bit of a trip into the nano dimension. We begin with a one millimeter scale, one needle eye or one pin head is one millimeter. Now take that and divide it 1,000 times. What you get is one micron right in the middle where the bacteria is. If in turn we take that micron and divide it 1,000 times again, we get one nanometer. DNA is uh, in the nanometer dimension up to viruses. And in the man-made uh, scale, we have a funny tube of carbons, carbon nanotubes, that I will introduce later. Next slide, please. This is what usually is uh, presented as the nano world, uh, exactly, from one to 100 nanometers. Now, why is it so important? I mean, this uh, seems to be a hype about uh, nanotechnology, graphene nanotechnology, why is that so important? It's just a fashionable word. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, when people tell me nanotechnology is, 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 is fashion, right? Uh, they are expecting me to say, no, 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 by no means. I say, yes, of course it is a fashion. But that, the important thing is that does not invalidate nanotechnology. Okay, there have been earlier fashions before, such as biochemistry, it's fashionable, new word, you know. Nanotechnology might be fashionable these days, but it's no uh, fake. It's a uh, very useful technology, very useful approach, and I will try to show it to you. Why is it so important? Well, you know, when you take matter to that nano dimension, it changes. The very nature and properties of that matter change. Let's take our good old friend, gold. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Why is gold so important? I mean, yes, uh, we, we, we love it. Why? Because we love to speculate with it. I mean, it's, uh, as a material, it's rather useless. It's good for nothing. It's inert. Well, it conducts electricity, but that's about it. It's shiny, shiny, and, and we like uh, shiny things. Guess what? In, if we take gold and reduce it to nanoparticles of nanometer sizes, what we get is solutions with a red color. And it's not only the color that changes, that is uh, optical properties, it's also chemical properties. Nanometric gold is a good catalyst, for instance. It's reactive. Contrary to the uh, uh, conventional gold uh, ingot that we have there, nanometric gold is chemically active and can help us in activating chemical reactions. Uh, by the way, uh, let me be honest with you. Uh, nanoscience is recent, but this kind of material has been known for ages. Let's see the next slide. Here's an example. It's Notre Dame de Paris, but it could be anywhere in the world. Any cathedral has some red stained glass. Well, uh, those uh, glass masters uh, mastered the fine art of dispersing gold to such a low, they wouldn't call it nano, but highly dispersed gold to get red pigments in those, uh, in those glasses. Of course, was that nanochemistry? No. It might have been called, if you want, nanoalchemy, if, if anything. 
there are old scientists, though, who did master the fine art of uh, colloidal gold. Let's see the next slide. The great genius Michael Faraday prepared those colloidal gold uh, suspensions, and he knew more or less what he was doing, but it was a primitive chemistry. What we have now is the opportunity to understand what we have that good old Michael Faraday didn't have is more knowledge and therefore more control over what we do with those uh, nanoparticles. Let me show you an example. That's why we call it nanoscience. Understanding makes the difference. Relating cause and effect is science. This is an example borrowed from a, a friend, dear friend and, and uh, a friend, of course, a friend and a colleague uh, working at the Institut Català de Nanociencia y Nanotecnologia. And uh, his group has developed a very interesting combination of materials. They use nanogold particles to be carriers of anti-tumoral drugs. Cisplatin has been known for quite a number of years, maybe decades, but it is a very hard drug. It kills uh, carcinogenic cells, but it also kills every healthy cell on its way there. Uh, this combination of cisplatin with uh, nano gold particles is able to protect the healthy cells. The thing attacks, delivers the, the, the drug selectively to uh, carcinogenic, to can cancer uh, cells. So this is one example of the difference that makes controlling and understanding versus just empirical knowledge that uh, Faraday had. But let's concentrate now probably on carbon. Well, graphene is uh, maybe the new kid in town of, of, of nanocarbon town, nanocarbon village, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to make a little bit of history. These guys didn't work on graphene, but uh, they were uh, three uh, colleagues said, who discovered, this was a, a serendipitous discovery, by the way, discovered how to make a soccer ball. And they got awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1996 for that. Well, can you believe it? Well, the, the little detail is that they made the first nano-sized soccer ball in the world. Let's take a look. That's it. As you see, that soccer ball, which they uh, labeled fullerene, in honor of a great architect, by the way, Buckminster Fuller, who had devised a geodesic dome vaguely similar to that shape. Well, as I say, they uh, serendipitously uh, discover that those 60 carbon atoms arrange themselves in such a symmetrical way, and they prove wrong uh, books. What people knew was wrong. Books were saying there are two allotropic forms of carbon, diamond and uh, graphite. One is hard, the other is soft, blah, 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 blah. Well, suddenly, science, science is a specialist in doing this. Scientists come one day and change the world. As soon as these guys publish their finding and others reproduced it, the world had, had changed. The books were wrong. There were other forms of carbon. For instance, C16, fullerene. By the way, let, please allow me to make a digression here. In honor of anonymous knowledge, anonymous creativity. Uh, I would not forget these guys labeling that Buckminster Fullerene, or Fullerene in short, because, uh, well, it's true, the architect was great and did a geodesic dome vaguely resembling that shape. But what do you 
tell me about the anonymous artisan who first sued such a beautiful symmetrical soccer ball. Well, he's uh, not known to anyone, but uh, here's a cheers to him or her. Okay, next uh, member in the family of nanocarbons was uh, carbon nanotubes. Here we have a photograph of Sumio Ijima, normally credited with the discovery of these uh, wonderfully elongated forms of uh, uh, carbon, another allotrope of carbon, oh my goodness. That was in 1991, and he was very smart in taking that photograph in front of a big, huge electron microscope, high resolution electron microscope. That is one of the techniques that makes the difference between knowing and controlling matter at the uh, atomic level. And then next, finally, we get the discoverers of uh, graphene. As I said, the new kid in town. Uh, they did it in 2004. Uh, remember I told you about that web page that was 2002, two years before. And many people had been calculating graphene theoretically, but these guys were the first ones to get it on their hands, under the, their microscopes, and uh, ready to be studied. Um, normally, they are a little bit, uh, well, yeah, put, put graphene on top of them, yeah, like that. This is, uh, 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 these guys, so why, why I did that? Well, because uh, some people tend to a little bit discredited them because they did get graphene in a very weird way. They got uh, graphite and scotch tape and with the tape, watch. They did that uh, several times and they got graphene. Oh, big deal. And they got the Nobel Prize again. Well, no, no, the Nobel Prize, they got it because they did measure, control, and understand the properties of matter at that atomic level. And that's one example of, of what I'm saying. For groundbreaking experiments regarding the two-dimensional material graphene. Oh, please. And since then, you see what happened with the number of papers. We scientists seem to live off paper production. Well, um, I have uh, included there the evolution with years of the number of papers of fullerenes in green, carbon nanotubes in blue, and graphene in red. And as you see, the beginning of each is shifted, of course, and every time the, the apparently exponential growth is faster. That is even more clear if we plot, we love plotting things, <laughs> in percentage. Look at that. In 2013, I think it is, it is in just one year, 40% of the papers, all papers related to graphene, were published in that very same year. It's quite outstanding. Of course, I had this uh, inquisitive mind and I thought, I don't believe it. Let's take one slowly moving field. Let's compare this with something that is not so hot. A slowly moving field, let's see, what could it be? Snails. And uh, I search for snail research, and guess what? It's also going up. The conclusion is that we live exciting times, I agree. We are living times in which uh, research is more abundant, and I hope is better, than anywhere, any uh, other time before. But of course, once said that, it is clear that graphene in percentage is the topic, the hottest topic growing faster than anything else. Why? Well, maybe because of this? Because it has a, well, list of superlative properties. It is the lightest, well, light as plastic, harder than diamond, stronger than steel, flexible, by the way, didn't put it there, mm. conducting like metals, transparent like glass, and you could put dot, 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 and the end of it is, and as simple as carbon, it's just carbon atoms. Well, no, it's not just carbon atoms. It's carbon atoms inside the pencil and human ingenuity, 
human creativity, human knowledge. It is that combination that flourishes and yields these uh, results. This is a very important me message I would like to, to pass, the combination of the hardware and the software. But let me uh, continue with, uh, let's say, what is expected out of graphene. One of the first thing uh, engineers are expecting is something that comes out of a combination of those properties. If you have a material that is conducting trans transparent, uh, well, conducting and transparent, you could have, well, uh, one of those uh, smartphones, you know, uh, the screen is actually an electrode. You need it to conduct electricity and it needs to be transparent. Well, uh, right now in our smartphones, what we have is uh, conducting uh, transparent materials made of indium tin oxide. But indium is not such an abundant uh, element and uh, indium tin oxide is relatively expensive. If we combine that transparency and conductivity with a material that in principle could be as cheap as carbon, then we would have cheaper um, screens. But if in addition it is flexible, then we will have flexible screens, flexible devices. So the message is new technologies allow for new technologies. New materials allow for added uh, performance. Not just improving upon what we have, but something new like this. But my favorite uh, field of applications is the next one, is energy. Energy and sustainability, as a matter of fact. Because I don't think we should be doing this just to keep growing this consumerism that we have fallen into. Despite the fact that I'm a scientist and I should maybe defend that notion, by no means. Uh, I believe in a more sustainable future, and that has to do with scientific knowledge, but also knowledge in general, social knowledge, political knowledge, my goodness. But let's talk about supercapacitors. That is but one example of graphene stepping hard on all fields, and in general, related with a sustainable society, which I must defend, uh, we will be uh, witnessing uh, better batteries and supercapacitors for energy storage, solar panels, flexible also, fuel cells, that is uh, hydrogen batteries, if you want, the hydrogen economy, water splitting, which is good for producing hydrogen from water, in, and even water purification and desalination. In all of those fields, graphene is excelling. And finally, the last example, graphene for better lives, especially for people with problems, uh, side problems, this is not to say that graphene will make all blind people see, but there are a specific kind of blindness related with retinal uh, damage, I don't remember the name, which is in the process of being sort of surmounted, if you want, not cured, but somewhat surmounted. It's a Spanish colleague working in Germany, and they have uh, developed retinal implants based on graphene. Uh, so it's such an exciting uh, new world. I mean, uh, should we dream of more? Of course we should, because as I pointed out before, that is what takes us, scientists and society in general, to reach utopia. Maybe I would end up pointing out that we might have paints that are solar panels, or cars that have uh, batteries on their structure or solar construction of, of uh, cars. There is, there is no limit but our imagination to whatever we can dream of concerning what we could do with graphene and nanotechnology. But remember, not only uh, the uh, scientific and, and technological knowledge, but also the uh, social and political. 
we need policy. And I say this from Spain, every effort we could make in developing good technologies could be counteracted with wrong policies. And we have that experience right now. So renewables is one example, but please visit the Graphene flagship uh, uh, website because there you will be able to see this funny cartoon on the G-Man and his superpowers. Uh, remember, um, we are here to help, not to uh, create a society that is uh, overdeveloped, over-consuming, and over-watching you. Now, my hope is for a more sustainable society, thanks to the help of the hardware, graphene, nanotechnology, and the software, our own ingenuity and creativity. Thank you very much.